Well, if you have your Bibles, you can turn with me to Titus 3. You know, I was thinking about the, uh, the National Day of Prayer today and um, what a joy it is to have an a administration that is directing America towards prayer. I, I was asked this morning in our deacons meeting, when's the last time that took place? I said, well, I'm pretty sure it wasn't last administration, but it has been a while, um, and so I'm so thankful for that. Well, I want to finish this morning our study in the pastoral epistles. We have um, been in this series for exactly a year. We started the second week of September, uh, this, this series of blueprints that we titled it, um, and uh, uh, today I want to finish with a, t- a message entitled Focused Church. Now, the premise of this study throughout this last year has been, as it says on the, on the screen there, to understand God's formal structure for His church. Now, with that statement, with that premise, really comes, I think, two keys or two ideas that are behind that. One is the idea that this is His church. It's, it's God's church, and so it's the structure that He desires for His church. Jesus Christ is the chief shepherd He is the one that leads the church, and we know that, and we want to then as a body to come around and to follow Him and glorify Him. The second aspect to that statement is that that God has a plan for how His church should be structured and to operate and be conducting itself. And that behooves us then to say, well, what is that? Um, And that drives me as a pastor to continue to examine Scripture and search Scripture to say, well, God, how do you want your church to operate? Um, it's, a, it's a burden of mine uh, as, a, as an under-shepherd of Jesus Christ to, to make sure that we are following God's plan. And so there's a lot of different polities or structures of a church that are brought to question. And the question, well, is this the best way? Is this the biblical way? way of a polity of a church and to not just simply follow mechanical or business models or tradition and so what is the biblical polity is it to have a a, a number of cardinals and bishops and popes and priests or should there be priests that oversee certain areas and, and that oversee churches and and oversee other pastors and elders and have the right is there is it should priests be over them and have the right to move pastors away and bring in other ones and to restructure churches? Or should a church be independent? Uh, polity questions of what's the best way to organize with boards and is it best to have a hired pastor and then you know a deacon board or is it better to have a plurality of pastors, some hired, some not, and and so all of those questions come to bear because uh, really the reality is when you look across the, the spectrum of really even evangelicalism and Christian churches today, there is a wide gamut. So the question isn't what is traditionally the way. The question isn't what is the best business model or how does Penn State do it so we should you know, do it that way. And the question really is, is God, how do you want your church to be functioning? What's the polity that you designed this to be in your church that will meet the needs and grow the church so that it can be best on point to expand the kingdom of God so that he gets the most glory? And so that's the question. And I mentioned a year ago as we began this that we have our internships that we call 222 internships out of 2 Timothy 2.2. And with our internships, we, we take our interns through a series of different goals that we have with them. And one of those goals is to help them grow in their understanding of the philosophy of the church, the whys of the church, and then also to help them grow in their understanding of the practice of the church. How does that work out? As we do counselors, we do different things. And, um, and so what we do with that with our internships is part of the requirements that they have is they have to do a study the pastoral epistles, and they have to outline it uh, throughout the books uh, the, of First and Second Timothy and Titus to help them understand 
well, what did Paul say? The, these pastoral epistles are known as the church primer. Well, what did Paul lay out as he's instructing Timothy in Ephesus and Ephesus and Titus in Crete, trying to help them as they're strengthening the churches there? What are some guidelines to help us think through that? And so really, over the last year, you have gone through a portion of an internship with us. We've gone through it together to study through the pastoral epistles and to examine that together as we desire to be a church that best glorifies God. And, um, and to point out as we've gone through this that my ende endeavor, desire has been to point out specific uh, mentions by Paul on, on how should a church choose pastors and what are the qualifications and the uh, same, what are the qualifications for deacons and, and, and how should a, a pastor be uh, structuring the church and as he dis is discerning doctrine and he puts an emphasis and throughout the epistles on, uh, on doctrine and starting to know truth and teaching that to preach the word, be instant in season, out of season and, and to go through that. And we've looked at that together throughout this study. And part of the purpose of this study has been a growing burden and a heartbeat as I have studied and desired to make the church as healthy and prosperous for the Lord Jesus Christ as possible, is to have seen a structure of a plurality of elders in the New Testament church. It wasn't always only hired staff. It wasn't only always hired pastors. You have little churches in Philippi and Corinth and, and, and Crete, and there's an a expectation or call for the pastors, plural, that are there to ordain pastors in every church, in every city. And, and so, as we see that emphasis, as we, we started to recognize there was a great benefit to the church if, if there would be a plurality of men who were there to help meet the spiritual and, and guidance of the church uh, with those needs and, and could focus on those eternal needs and then there'd be a plurality of other godly men who are deacons who are helping meet the physical needs and, and, and coming around people are going through maybe medical or health needs or going through physical needs that they could come around and help them in those areas. And the church is best ministered to when you have that dual plurality. Begin to recognize that yes, we have a plurality. We have in our church, as far as the plurality of elders, we have Aaron and myself, but for two men to try to meet the spiritual needs of a congregation of membership that's well over 300 people, that becomes a daunting and difficult task. And as we began to recognize, most of the early church churches were very small. They were meeting in houses, and yet there was a call for a plurality of pastors, which meant that there was a greater number in that. And so we began to recognize and look at that, um, as we saw even throughout many places in Scripture, it talks about a plurality, and it uses the term oftentimes elder or bishop or pastor, it uses those interchangeably throughout the New Testament, um, and uses those in some texts interchangeably right within the chapter, right in the context. But we read places like Acts 11.30, the elders at the church of Antioch. Acts 14.23, Paul and Barnabas appoint elders in every church. Uh, where we read in, in Acts 20 and 17 and 28, when call, Paul called for the elders and the bishops at the church of es Ephesus. He calls them elders in one place, calls them bishops in another place, the same group of men uh, the church of Ephesus. We see other places in Philippians 1.1, 1, 1, the church of Philippi with its bishops and deacons. And so, repeatedly, and there's many more we can look at, there is this expectation of a plurality. And so, we began to analyze that, and my heartbeat throughout this study was, let's go through the church primer together, let's look at the pastoral epistles, and then let's move towards this greater strengthening opportunity of a plurality of men. Let's look at the qualifications of some men. Let's begin to prepare up some other qualified godly men who that's their gifting that's their calling to help lead and to help shepherd this church family and um, and so now as we complete this study today after a year-long study uh, my desire is then to appoint 
and call together a, poll, or a, uh, a, um, a constitution committee that will begin to look at how is this going to work out, the delineation of, of aspects within our church family and prepare our church to move towards ordaining and calling um, lay elders within this church body and start begin preparing some of these men that that is their gifting and that is their calling um, is in the shepherding eldership uh, re uh, realm. And so we're going to be working on that together. Now, I, I recognize that we are, are busy on many fronts. Uh, we've got a, a building committee and we're working on, on a building program. And, and we've got a pulpit committee who's working on actually looking at a candidate right now and hopefully soon being able to present a candidate to the church body. Um, and, and that's going on. And and so I realize there's a, there's a lot of different things. We're starting up small groups and Awanas and Bible studies, and there's a lot going on. But So we're, we're not saying this is going to happen overnight, um, but we, we desire to have a, a group of people being able to look at that and then bring that to the current pastors and, elder, uh, and deacons and then present that to the church family to move us in that direction. So that said, that's where we are heading. And if you have any questions on that, uh, if you want to read some further things about that, we provided some different books earlier. If you want some more to read on that, feel free to come to myself anytime and we would be happy to answer any questions. Now, let's finish, though, the study uh, and, and finish out the book of Titus. And, um, and then we'll partake of communion together. And, and I, I want us to look this morning as he really brings us, encapsulates it together, and he, he talks about being a focused church. Now that's focus and dedication is sometimes hard. Um, I was reading a, a testimony of, of a violinist, uh, Fritz Kreisler. He was a famous violinist and he testified that the challenge of staying focused on one task and focused on uh, his efforts to be a, a professional violinist. And he said this, he said, narrow is the road that leads to the life of a violinist hour after hour, day after day, <clears throat> and week after week, for years, I lived with my violin. There were so many things that I wanted to do that I had to leave undone. There were so many places I wanted to go that I had to miss if I was to master the violin. The road that I traveled was a narrow road, and the way was hard. So focus, intentionality, it, it speaks of a clear direction and perception, uh, knowing exactly what we're targeting for. And that's an important concept. Now, the reality is, is each one of us, the reality is, is you are only given the same amount of time, same amount of hours in every day as everybody else. As much as we'd like to have more, as much as we'd like to have 30 hours in a day um, or an eight day week, we're only given so much time. And so we have to ask ourselves, how do we stay focused to use that time well? And it's the same way in a church uh, and knowing how to use that well. And man, that's, that's hard staying focused sometimes, isn't it? I, I will attest, this, this humored me <clears throat> as I was studying for this and I began to recognize sometimes how hard it is for me. I wanted to, to look up, I have a, on, online, there's Webster's 1828 Dictionary. I just want to look up and see what it said on focus. So I... I pulled up the internet and I, it came up to the, the main website. Well, there was these news articles. And, and it, one caught my attention uh, about uh, what was taking place down in, with Hurricane Harvey and, and these, at the chemical plant with these explosions and things that were taking place. And I began reading this article and I finished that and I thought to myself, now why did I come to the internet? What was I? And I literally, I sat there for a second and I thought, I was going to look up focus. I was looking for the definition of focus, and I recognize maybe you're the same way. Staying focused is really hard sometimes. And it's that way as a church, it's that way as believers to know, I mean, I've got to stick at this, and I've got to push everything else away at times. And, and as much as we sometimes like to blame it on old age, oh, I'm just getting older and I forget, and that isn't the case all the time. It's just a matter of dedication and commitment to it, intentionality. And sometimes we just struggle with a sheer lack of focus. And so 
while there is a lot of great truth to this, the question is, well, how do we do this as a church? How do we do this as believers? And Paul is going to finish this letter to Titus with an emphasis of being focused as a church. Now, we stated before that our goal, our, our desire as a church, our, our vision statement is this. Our vision is to see Christ glorified to the lost coming to Christ, the building up of the body of Christ, so that we all come to maturity in Christ. We see that Christ is most glorified in that. If we see more people come to know Him, and then they are grown up and built up, and the body is built up together in Christ, Christ is glorified. And Satan has always been working to challenge the focus of a church. Satan is working to challenge your focus, to challenge the priorities in your life. And he wants to try to make it sound like other things are a higher priority and you can always determine what is the highest priority in your life by what takes precedence when there's a conflict of activities. You only have so many hours and so when two things are crunching or are asking for the same time in the day, you will determine what is most important and a highest priority in your life by what wins out in that situation. And by the way, you teach your children and your grandchildren and those around you what is really highest priority when you make that choice. We can teach them that yes, we have no other gods before us and that Jesus Christ is first in our lives, but if He gets pushed out by every other sport or if He gets pushed out by every other extra hours that we can pull at work or He gets pushed out because we're too tired to come, you begin to define for them and explain for them and show them what is highest priority. And Satan has always been working to try to press in a lot of stuff. We are one of the most busy societies on the face of the earth. There are so many things that vie for your time, that vie for your attention and want you to give to that. And so we have to really ask, I need wisdom, God, to know what is best, to know what is right. And so there are all kinds of things. And it was the same all the way back as well in the time of Crete. There was things pressing in. Um, the religious establishment. There was, there was even religious groups that were trying to press in religious requirements and those things. And we need to, 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 then to recognize what is most important. We need to recognize, well, how do we determine if all these religious groups are even trying to press in? We look at chapter 1 and there was those who were trying to press in with, well, you have to do these extra requirements and circumcision was expected and, and all these extra things. And, and so, how do we know what is best? How do we know when, when there, are, there are all kinds of televangelists and blog writers and authors that are saying this and saying that. How do we know what is the right thing? I would say this. Judge them all against the canon, the rule, the standard, the Word of God. That's what the canon is. It's the standard. And judge it against the Word of God. Does it line up there? And so it takes discernment. It takes study. It takes a walk, a daily, regular walk with God to know that. So these last few verses, Paul's going to help Titus keep the church on focus by giving some caution and then also some concluding instructions. I want to give us time for communion together, so we're going to move quite quickly. So strap on your seatbelt and and hang on with me, uh, if you would. Let's pray together, and then we'll get going. Father, thank you for our time together this morning. I pray that you guide our thoughts and our hearts, that we would stay and be a people that are prioritized and focused. Lord, we recognize that there is, there is a, a constant battle that takes place in our lives, a constant battle that takes place in this church over the priority of our time and, and the priori- priority of truth. And so, God, I pray that you would help us to understand what is best. And would you guide us this morning? In Jesus' name, amen. Let's begin with, first of all, some caution to the church regarding factious believers or factious people. I shouldn't say believers. He's really dealing with false teachers here in verses 9 through 11. And he deals with two groups of people that is, he's going to warn about. The first is in verse 9 where he says, But avoid foolish disputes, genealogies, 
contentions, and strivings about the law, for they are unprofitable and useless. There are things that we can waste time on. And so the first point I want you to recognize is we need to avoid the useless. We need to determine what is the things that's worth contending about or contending for, and which things are not worth the contention. To turn away here, the, he uses the word to avoid. It means to purposely turn away from. The idea here is to turn away from the morally and spiritually destructive false teachers. Don't let them distract you from the truth. Let them harm the reputation of the gospel that you preach. And so the reality is, is to deal with factious people, church leaders as well, especially, need to determine if an issue is worth contending over or not. And he, he emphasizes four areas here of error. He calls, first of all, foolish disputes. The word for foolish is moros, from which we get our word moronic. Moronic or useless or senseless disputes. And the word disputes, zetasis, always has a negative connotation in Paul's letters of warnings, of things that are, are, are unworth our, worth our time. He actually, in 1 Timothy 6, Verses 3 and 4, he uses the same word. He says, If anyone teaches otherwise and does not consent to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ and the doctrine of which accords with godliness, he is proud, knowing nothing, but is obsessed with disputes and arguments over words from which come envy and strife and reveling and evil suspicion. He says, There are some who are just pressing an agenda that is... It is causing disputes. It's senseless. It does not help. Now, I, I love, and I know some of you love apologetics. You, you love to debate on certain areas of matters. And there is a health to that. This is not writing off apologetics. I am so thankful for, for men like Ravi Zacharias and Josh McDowell and others who have, who have given their lives and their ministries, that's how they're gifted up, is to discern with wisdom and to, to know the, the truth of God on matters, and they defend truths. But you know, they also have to have the wisdom to know which areas are worth staking claim and fighting and making all their energies and all their efforts on. They can't fight every battle. They can't contend on every issue. And there are real issues that we should stand up for, though. Issues on uh, the, the, the uh, inerrancy and sufficiency of the Word of God. The deity of Jesus Christ, His virgin birth, His resurrection, His, His efficacious uh, death, burial, and resurrection for us. And the reality is He's just talked about in the Gospel in verses 3 through 7, 4 through 7, just prior to us that the Gospel is that God saved us. And we can't add to that. Those are areas that that are worth standing for. But there are also a lot of other areas that we can spend a lot of time on that isn't, isn't going to get you there. That isn't going to really convert people, doesn't increase their faith, won't increase your faith, doesn't really help the matters of the church. You, you can spend hours writing a thesis on why alien life forms aren't really there. Um, and we did not come from alien life forms. And we can spend all kinds of time on those things. But he says, hey, you know what the reality is? We need to recognize, avoid things that are foolish disputes. And he says, secondly, genealogies. That was common that they would dispute over those things and, and try to set up which family line was greater than this family line. And he says, don't waste time on that. Then there's contentions. And some translations have strife. A general term that carries the idea of all kinds of self-centered rivalry. It takes great wisdom to know what battles are worth fighting for. And then he has, fourthly, disputes about the Mosaic law. Uh, what kinds of meats they could eat or what are requirements. And he says, we need to be careful on this. And the point is this. Those who disregard God's word as the sole authority for truth and practice, is, you're going to come across people who are going to have these different ideas. But those who disregard God's word are coming from a whole separate foundation. So someone who's going to have this argument over here who wants to contend with you, if they don't believe in the sufficiency and the uh, inerrancy of the Word of God, you're fighting over fruit, and you might throw a whole lot of fruit at their fruit, 
but it doesn't change the foundation. And so we have to be cautious to know how to spend our time. And um, he, says, he says, these things are, notice he says there in verse 9, for they are unprofitable and useless. Well, contrast that to verse 8. This is a faithful saying, and these things I want you to affirm constantly that those who have believed in God should be careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable men. What's he just emphasized? Well, in verses 4 through 7, he's emphasized the gospel that God saved us. It wasn't by our works that He is merciful, He is gracious, He is loving, He is kind. And this is what is our main priority. Our main priority of the church is to take the gospel of Jesus Christ to every creature. To go around and to share that with Jesus Christ. And that ought to drive us then to live that out and motivate. The gospel ought to motivate our lives to live out Christianity. To emphasize that to the world around us so that we can give them the gospel. So that people recognize, man, they need Jesus Christ above everything else. You may win the battle on a certain topic, but if it doesn't direct them to Jesus Christ and their need for a Savior, we've lost the war. We've lost our purpose. And we've got to know, man, I need to stay on task. And so he gives some caution there and gives the yardstick of the gospel is our main driving emphasis. But then he also sets a, a, a broader spectrum and he says, reject the divisive. Reject the divisive man of the first and second admonition, knowing that such a person is warped and sinning, being self-condemned. And um, he, he really here casts a broader net, including anyone, even Christians, who are divisive and disruptive, that can div divide a church, a loving church, and can cause the, the ministry focus and the attentions to be wasted. A lot of energies in a church, a lot of resources in a church are often wasted in churches because there is combat within. And he says, hey, when that stuff happens, go, and, go, and, go to that person and, and correct that divisiveness. And he really uses the same idea of Matthew 18. That they ought to go two times seeking them to repent and, and be restored and don't be divisive over these things to, to, to maintain the right focus of the gospel. But he says if they still are seeking to draw people away to their own agenda, their own pet uh, uh, soapbox over an issue that is causing problems, they're trying to, to pull people away from the direction and focus of the church, he says you need to reject them. Now, there's, that's a pretty hard word. Commentators are divided over what does that mean to reject them. And some say, oh, it can't be excommunication. It can't be church discipline. But I can't imagine that Paul is encouraging to leave those who are causing dissensions and causing disunity in a church just to still continue in that practice. So he takes that pretty hard stance of the importance of unity and striving together for the gospel of Jesus Christ, Philippians 1.27. Striving together. Moving together. Notice what he says, though. Because those who won't heed that, they are warped and sinning. I like that word warped. My brother and I used to always call each other. I always said he has a warped mind. Man, you got a warped mind. And, um, but as the idea here that, 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 that means that they are corrupted, they're perverted, they're turned inside out. He says they are sinning and being self-condemned. The reality is this, the real issue isn't often doctrine. The real issue is sin. And this battle over a certain doctrine is the cover-up that they're putting all their attention into to cover up sin areas in their lives. It's, the reality is this, it's, it's far easier to debate theology or abstruse points of doctrine than it is to love your wife and your children as Christ loved the church, or to bring your children up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, to be a good worker at your job, or to practice the fruit of the Spirit on a daily basis. That is not to say that other parts of, of theology are unimportant. It's not to say that we shouldn't dig in the Word of God and search out the Scriptures daily. But if 
if we are driving on one point and we are seeking to divide and get factions over here that take my side on this position, and that becomes our whole emphasis of all around our lives, Paul says, I'm telling you, there's something behind that. There is sin because true doctrine, true Scripture, and as you draw together in Scripture, it ought to unite, not divide. Because the more we draw closer to Christ, there is a unity to that. To be able to say, you know what, brother, yeah, we hold a different position on this. <clears throat> and that's okay. It's not a major factor. And I love you. Let's serve together. Let's serve together on the major things. Let's take the gospel of Jesus Christ. And let's serve together, help building this missions house out here. And, and we might differ a little bit on, on certain areas. But this is the most important area that we help get the gospel to people that need it. And so that we need to recognize that and the importance of that. So he gives a caution here at the end. And then lastly, then he gives a conclusion to the church regarding fellow servants. Now, let, me just, let me just wrap this together because our, our time is, is, is fleeting. But he deals with here in these final words. Let me just read it and then we'll, we'll draw just a final point. When I send Artemis to you or Tychicus... And so he starts to lame out some people, these two guys. We don't, we don't know anything about Artemis, but Tychicus we've seen. He's a faithful guy, so both of these are faithful. He says, be diligent to come to me at Nicopolis. For I have decided to spend the winter there. That's most likely Nicopolis. There was nine of them, actually, in that day. Nine different places called Nicopolis. It was most likely the one in, in the, the southern part of, uh, of Greece, uh, in Achaia. He says, come to me there. I want to spend time with you. And he says, send Zenus, the lawyer, and Apollos on their journey with haste. Now for those of you that are studying law or are lawyers, hey, there is your saving grace. This guy, Zenus, is, is spoken highly of. Um, and so there are good lawyers in, in, in the world. And, and Paul says, hey, encourage, encourage this guy, Zenus, and Apollos. Support them in their ministry as they're going out. And um, he says and, and that they may lack nothing and let our people also learn to maintain good works to meet urgent needs that they may not be unfruitful. And so he gives here really a, a partnership in ministry is essential, and then participation in ministry is beneficial. As we partner with them, he says, hey, send out these guys, Zenos and Apollos, uh, not, not, only in, not only in prayers, but, man, give them what they need so those guys can go out and do the ministry. Hey, Titus, make sure the churches in Crete are, are coming behind these guys so they can go on and they lack nothing. You know what that is? Is that is pure missions right there. That is churches partnering with other churches to partnering with missionaries to go do the work of evangelism. I'm so thankful for a missions-minded church. I, I am blown away by the heartbeat of this church for missionaries. 28% of our entire budget goes to missions. Uh, we are building a whole house for our missionaries. We just had a donation to buy a, a, a new vehicle for our missionaries that we're looking to get, and we're working on that. We have had, when we poured out, we, we, we extended the, the needs for the, the Smiths after they were broken into. The church poured out help and support. When we extended the needs for the Millers when they were um, uh, needing a car because their car broke down, they needed a vehicle in, in Africa. The church poured out uh, support and helped them in many ways. We've, we have helped uh, provide uh, supplies for the tents and, and the camping ministry in Chile with Jared Park this year. I mean, just over and over again, this church has just had a heartbeat for missions. And I want to commend you for that. And that's what exactly what Paul says. Hey, let's, let's let the church participate in good works. Let's let them participate in the ministry together. This is what we do. We take the gospel by helping uh, partner with and participating with ministries and missionaries around the world. Why? Why is this such a focus? Well, because of what Christ did for us. It goes really back to verses 4 through 7, really 3 through 7, that, that we, were, we, we were depraved, we were, uh, we were lost in sin, verse 3. But then verses 4 through 7, but when the kindness and the love of God appeared and His goodness to us, He saved us. It wasn't by any works that we did, but Christ saved us. By the washing of regeneration, by the renewing of the Holy Spirit, we're made new. That drives us in ministry to say, you know what? 
that's the focus. That, that's what we're going to go after. We don't want to get distracted by other things. We're going to go after taking the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we want to do that together. It's a unity thing. As a church family, we, we choose missionaries and we partner together and we're going to build this house together to help meet needs of our missionaries. Because we have a sole focus that we want to see the lost come to Christ and the body be built up in Christ so that Christ is glorified. That's what it's about as we stay focused. And so there's really where Paul finishes this study all bringing back to the focus of the gospel of what Christ did for us. Let's pray together and we'll prepare our hearts to remember that together to the Lord's table this morning. Father, we do thank you for what Christ did for us and that it's because of His coming and His death on the cross that, that we have new life. And God, I pray that you'd help us as a church that we would stay united around that central theme of the gospel. And that would drive us to know you and to dig into your word in Bible studies and prayer groups, that we would dig in to know you more and we'd share that love of Christ with others. We even think about today is there's churches that are hurting down in, in Texas and Louisiana after being flooded out and, and they're striving to meet needs there and to take the gospel to people. And as we even meet here in a little while to, to have a, a, a group go to Honduras to go take the gospel down there. Lord, help us to stay focused on the main thing. Lord, that you are a God who is worthy of glory. You are a God who loved us so much that you bestowed that upon us by giving us a Savior. And that when we weren't worthy, when we could do nothing to fix the problem, you saved us. That all who come to Jesus Christ are in no wise cast out, but they find a place of forgiveness a place of grace. And God, I pray that you would help us, that that would motivate our, our unity, that would motivate our participation together of the gospel ministry. And God, as we move even forward at choosing or ordaining elders and moving forward to strengthen the church body together, God, I pray that you would help us to stay gospel-centered Christ-centered for your glory. And we thank you for what you're doing in this place. It's so exciting to see your hand here. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.